Morning, everybody. Welcome to this Golden Burst morning. Golden Burst is a red tea. So by the end of this session, you're going to know a few things about red tea. It's going to be a little historic heavy because I'm going to talk about red tea in Europe and in China. Catch a few other places along the way. Then I'll talk briefly about processing. I'll talk about where science is headed with red tea. And let's go ahead. Now, for those of you who just got up, you don't realize that I sent you an article this morning and a map. Map was good enough. I mean, it showed a few of the relevant things, you know, the Fujian province, Wuyi Mountains, the place called Fuan, F-U-A-N. In a minute, I'll tell you exactly where that is. But let's talk about that brief article that I sent you. Now that comes from a national coffee and tea publication. And they published this thing this week. And for fun, occasionally I look at this publication. I'm on their mailing list, see what sorts of interesting stories they're putting forth. And this one immediately came to man, mind. So what's the lead on this? The lead is that heretofore, that is before January of this year, no Anhua, that is Hunan, in quotes, dark, or what we would call Hunan black tea, has been exported to the US. Now let's see here. I am thinking about this statement and thinking about the fact that we've been importing this tea since 2016, several different varietals from this exact region. Gotta check the details. When people write articles like this, they don't understand the details. This was written out of China, but they also didn't understand the details. They glossed over this. So at any rate, I thought I'd share this with you because this was in a national publication. And just in case you idly read this publication, hey, didn't John say that they have Hunan Black? We do, and we've had it for a while. So that's number one thing. Let's look at that map for a minute. The map of Fujian. I sent you a very simple map because we really only want to look at two places. So if you open up the map and you look at the northernmost and then you go slightly west, there's something called the Wuyi Mountains there. W-U-I-E in the mountains. Okay, we know what that is. That's where Cliff T comes from. That's on the border of Jiangxi province. Now, go directly east all the way nearly to the coast Go south a little bit and you see a small dot called F-U-A-N. That's where we are today. Golden Burst comes from Fuan area. What is Fuan like from a terrar situation? It's rich, it's spooky actually as you drive through the mountains. What do I mean by spooky? What I mean is that fog hangs in these beautiful ways all over the mountains. Every time I've been there in any season, this is what you have. Then on top of that, you have these small villages and you come upon them suddenly because there isn't a lot of signage in this area. You're driving along and there it is. And farmers, are embedded deep in these mountains and for years have been producing very famous red teas. Some years more, some years less. So let's right away launch into history. Let's think about this a minute. When was tea showing up in Europe? Well, that's a hard question to answer precisely. We do have some precision 
that by 1610, either the Dutch or the Portuguese had imported tea from, that had passed through Indonesia into Europe. We do have that much. We know that tea was already in Africa by 1433. And why do I mention Africa? I realize Africa and Europe are two different continents, but Africa was controlled by Europe, basically. So whatever was entering Africa, the Europeans had some sense, although they may not have had a very good sense. And remembering, of course, in 1433, what would have been showing up in Africa? Most likely green tea, because 1433, the process for other teas had matured as far as we understand currently. We also know that tea was being carried along the Silk Road. What was the impetus for that? Obviously trade, but more importantly, the communication with Buddhist countries. In other words, you had monks going along and monks all the way back in the Tang Dynasty that's got ourselves situated 618 to 960, had already essentially said, hey folks, and the folks they were talking to were fellow Buddhists, let's not do the alcohol thing. Let's do the tea thing. Tea thing helps with meditation, helps alertness. It's a good drink for us Buddhists. In addition, though you didn't have them traveling along the Silk Road, the Taoist had done that essentially as well. But although they hadn't forsaken wine and spirits necessarily, but they were into tea as well. Buddhist is essentially forsaken alcohol. So that's kind of a picture of how tea is traveling. Now let's think about the other way tea is traveling possibly through Russia. Why? The Russians were gifted tea at the imperial court in 1687 or 1688. And this was to help cement relations between China and Russia, help keep the borders pacified. And it was just good manners when a new czar ascended the throne. And so they already started to enjoy tea. Now, remembering that Russia is both an Asian country and a European country, and remembering that whatever went to the court did not go down among the population because it was very expensive, it was very highly prized. That meant maybe Russians were aware but not very familiar with tea. So how did that familiarity increase? It increased because the Chinese really needed horses and they needed horses from 700 on. So from 700 to 1700, there was this brisk trade of tea, tea for horses. So let's, situate ourselves in another way. Tea for horses. How much tea is a great horse worth? It's about 140 pounds. Now, how do I know this? Because the tax rolls, both in China and in Russia, recorded these transactions. Great horses, 140 pounds. And I assume that's 140 pounds of really good tea. An average horse, 40 pounds of tea. So that was the range. One other thing you should be aware of, starting in the 1700s, and why am I placing myself in the 1700s? You notice I seem to be jumping around. It's not as much of a jump as it might seem, although a thousand years is a long time. I'm really trying to get you to think about how tea is starting to leave China. So in the 1700s, late 1600s, early 1700s, they started to have camel caravans into Russia. 
And each camel could carry about 540 pounds. This is closer to 600 pounds worth of tea. And they usually have these caravans of about 100, sometimes up to 500. So big old caravans carrying tea into China. What type of tea, you're asking yourselves, might they have been carrying? Well, it wasn't green tea, it was red tea. Because already by that time, the Russians are saying, hey, give me the red stuff. And what did that do to the price of tea since it took 18 months for this journey? Ooh, that made it very expensive. Tea inherently from China at that time was expensive. You had 18, 16 to 18 months. That is hugely expensive. So you had all this tea going out. You had the expense of transportation. But what I'm trying to indicate is it's landing in Asia slash Europe, and it's starting to be known. In Britain, and I know Britain is just one part of Europe. Sometimes I use Britain as if that's the code word for all of Europe. And in a minute, I'll tell you why. In Britain, what were they getting in the beginning? In the 1600s, they were getting green tea. And they were liking it because they could actually improve the sanitation and health of everybody because it was a boiled product. So when did red tea start to enter Europe and particularly Britain? It seems to have started by around 1650, 1660. And then it picked up in the 1700s. It picked up so much that the British Department of Treasury was saying, hey, wait, 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 all our gold and so forth is traveling to China. Hey, wait a minute, aren't we the imperial masters? How come trade is going in this direction? So all of these thoughts. And so originally, originally, this wasn't so much a racist thought. It was really more, we are the imperial empire. And as such, if the Spanish had been getting that money, the British would have been just as annoyed. Now, it was even more complicated because the relations between Britain and China were complicated by the fact that they were both led by imperial dynasties. And the imperial dynasty in China didn't brook any nonsense in terms of who was really in charge. And that's what eventually led to the Opium War in the, the first one in the 1840s and then subsequent ones in the 1860s. So we're trying to get this flow of tea. Red tea is the predominant tea starting after the 1660s. What tea type was being counterfeited and sold at high profit. And how does this relate to red tea? So in Britain, green tea, the earliest tea that entered, started to be counterfeited. And you started to have things put in there, you know, fruits, flowers, all sorts of things that weren't originally in there. Chinese had long, long ago done that route and said, oh no, we're not doing this anymore. They'd done that route six or 700 years before. And no, that doesn't make sense for what we're growing. And so the Chinese, I'm sorry, the British gradually came to the conclusion, you know what, let's just make this change to red tea. Now it was helped by one of the Portuguese princesses. You didn't know you were gonna get a full slate of history. I apologize. I will uh, brief this history a little bit more than I have, but it is really interesting. One of the Portuguese princesses married the British monarch and as part of the gift, she brought red tea. 
And then, and this was probably 1687 or so. And then on top of that, because she got hungry in the afternoons and dinner wasn't typically served until 8.30 or so, she started this habit of tea time. And so this was an elite habit that started and it was a habit to get the royals through the afternoon and then be able to make it to dinner without fainting. All right, I have wandered very far into history. I'm having fun with it, but eventually you're gonna say, where's my tea? So I think before I wander much more in history, let's get everybody some tea this morning. And as you're doing this tea, I want you to note some things. Take good notes on quality assessment. Take good notes on flavor and aroma. This is a Fujian tea. And we're going to do three straight reds. And they're going to be different. And so this is a chance for you to have the opening round of a comparison. So it is my great pleasure to bring Xiaobe, the tea master. Hi, good morning. Yeah. Okay, we do golden first. So let's tea from the, you know, the one in Fujian or Paris in China. So they do glass. Uh, so same thing, so I use glass too. This is the, my style, another three. So I take another 175. So the same tableau as you would normally see, three glasses. You don't have to have three glasses, two is enough, but we use three glasses so you can dissipate the heat faster. Making sure that the cups are completely clean. No leftover soap stains or anything like that. And heating them because at the end of the day, it's this interplay between heat, leaves, and water. And at some point, the leaves go in and you want to, in effect, open them up. And then when you add the water, you want to make sure you don't scold the leaves because you don't want to flatten the flavor. You, in fact, put it in at a temperature that brightens the flavor. So all of these things interplay. And that's what the tea master is showing you here. This pain, the steam. One seventy five is the recommended temperature. Yes, one seventy five is the recommended temperature. Uh, T regulars has one seventy in her notes with a question mark. Uh, if there's one seventy in the notes, that's because when you leave things to an understudy, all sorts of confusion happens. However, I will tell you authoritatively: use one seventy five. So this, you got four grams of this. We're setting the timer for two minutes. Adding the tea to the heated cup. Shaking the cup. So shaking the cup, you're not actually shaking the cup as much as you're shaking the leaves. Leaves are heated, you smell, you know that, yes, this is indeed golden burst. And then you add water. Set your timer for two minutes. Can you get it started? 
Sweet. Good. That's good. So as you're this tea, remember, yes, I did. Uh, remember, we start off with 175, but as we're dissipating it, we're actually doing two things. We're dissipating the heat and uh, we're cooling it off a little bit. So typically tea masters in China would do this process and get a, a, the best possible flavor uh, from this. All right, so let's leave history for a minute. Let's do process because process is real easy as a generalized box. It's not easy overall, but for a, a generalized way, it is easy. I think I'm off. Okay, so a brief tea ghost appearance in there. So I'm going to talk about process, the Kung Fu process. And what it really is, is you pick, you wither for X amount of time, usually around 12 hours or so. You reduce the water to 60 to 62% in leaves. You roll to break down the leaves and then you pile to oxidize the leaves. At the very end, you bake a couple times to reduce the moisture in the leaves to an acceptable level so that the leaves don't mold. When you pile, you oxidize to, an, again, an acceptable level. You don't want to over-oxidize because if you do, you create sourness. All right, two minutes is expired. Team master is going to separate the leaves from the tea liquid. Terrific. So the first thing we know, aside from that the aroma grabs you from a mile away, is the color of this thing. This is the color of this. This is not atypical of good or great red teas. Not atypical at all. You take a look at the leaves themselves, very uniform. That's one thing you'll notice right away. You take an aroma test to get yourself started thinking about this. Very distinctive. And this will be different than the other ones we taste. And then you enter the quality arena. Quality arena, remembering that we're going to take a 175 degree tip, a sip. And what we're going to try and do is ascertain levels of astringency, mouth feel, as you roll it around your tongue, where in your mouth you are affected, you're going to register aftertaste. And at some point, you're also going to register energetics. So let's start this process. OK, I'm getting an understanding of mouthfeel. I'm getting a sense of aftertaste. I'm going to do this one more time. Okay. And I might get a sense from this. I'm already starting to get a little sense of energetics. Now, as you go into this, this is very important because this set of teas is going to tell you something about this region in particular. So as you're thinking of aroma and taste, this is very characteristic of Fujian Kung Fu teas. All right, it's your turn to brew. You go through the process of making sure, and I know you've already done this, making sure everything is clean and ready and your timer is set for two minutes. 
then you're going to draw your 175 degree water. Actually, uh, you can draw any temperature in the beginning to heat the cups and clean them. Notice you're doing this with rhythm, not in a hurry. Making sure that all the cups are heated. You're drawing your 175 degree water and you're about to dissipate the steam. Remembering that when you dissipate the steam, you brighten the flavor. If you don't do this process, you tend to flatten the flavor. This is why this is important. And not in a hurry. Just want to make sure you thoroughly do this. Good. And you notice the team master went through a little uh, thing there, and you may not know. She put both her hands here because she makes a judgment based on the feel of the glass where she is. You'll learn to do this over time, particularly if red teas or green teas or white teas become your favorite teas because understanding that temperature on an intuitive basis will be helpful to your whole tea practice. You add the four grams, and shake up the leaves, and really more than shaking them, what you're doing is you're distributing the heat so they open up. And then on the side of the glass, you're going to add the water. And set your time for two minutes. OK, you heard me a minute ago quickly go through the process. So where did this process probably develop, and why am I spending time on it today? It really developed in Fujian province. Remember, when you're doing Wulong teas, as they were doing in the Wui Mountains, and that's why we look at that location today, you're going through some sort of semi-oxidation. Sometimes you're oxidizing up to 80%. What if you have an accident? If you have an accident, you might end up in the 90% and you can't create the same sort of tea. So this is undoubtedly how they ended up in this craft tea situation in Fujian province. And I do know, and I have talked to you before, that in Anhui province, there was a form of doing tea which might also have led to heavily oxidized. But I believe that those developed independently. And I also believe that the oxidation process in Fujian, in fact, I'm sure, particularly in Fuan, developed fine tuning. And the process I went through was increased by four or five more steps of shaping and heating and cooling. So the teas from this area were very beloved by the 1700s in Britain. And in fact, during the 1800s, they were producing 50,000 tons in this bucolic environment in Fuan. And it was all going to Britain. This wasn't being consumed here. I'm sorry, all going to Europe, most of it to, to Britain. And so the result is you're thinking to yourself, well, gosh, this is a really rich red tea area. They must be doing something even greater today. And the answer would be no. All right. Your timer has gone off. 
for separating the tea from the tea leaves from the tea liquor. Your color should look something like this. Very, very beautiful. You should be looking at these leaves. And remember what I said about this, uniformity. What is it about craft Fujian teas that's so, so special? Well, a lot of things, but one in particular, which tells you from it, it's from that craft tradition is the uniformity. And by the way, in Chinese, how would you call this craft tradition? You'd say Kung Fu. And this Kung Fu is mastery or craft. That's what the meaning of it is. And was it in just one place? Was it in this single set of villages in Fuan? The answer is no. Fujian developed several different craft centers, including very famous ones, Tanyang, uh, Bailing, several different craft centers. But all of that, when China collapsed after the Qing dynasty, went away. It didn't go completely away, but mostly went away. And why is that? That's because China was unable to really keep focus on those areas. There was competition from Chima Needle uh, and other uh, red tea producers, but mainly the Chima Needle in Anhui. And here's what really happened with this. Almost a kind of bait and switch type of situation, but from the purchaser, this is what I mean. So the British would and go to or send agents to these farms and say, if you produce something really unique, we'll pay a high price for it. The farmers worked on stuff, produced some really unique stuff. Well, that's great until the second year. What happened the second year? Everybody's producing this stuff and the price falls through the floor. In addition, when the tea market headquarters was in London, what was happening aside from manipulation? You're getting this influx of tea from Sri Lanka. You're getting, so Thomas Lipton was in Sri Lanka and he was famous in the uh, 1780s or was it the 1880s? I think it's 1880s for being one of the first to from plantation to retail store selling tea. In India, some, some of the big tea makers soon followed suit. And by the way, let's make it clear here because we're talking a little history. When again was the first tea bag? Oh heavens, that was 1908. So pre-1908, were the British used, they didn't even know tea bag. All they knew was loose leaf. And so this led to also a revolution in Europe in pot making, because when you have loose leaf, you know, it's really hard to handle if you don't have a sieve in, inside the pot, you have to fire the pots a certain way. So the Dutch were the first ones in the late 1600s to accomplish this, but these were all drivers of change in the industry in Britain. The drivers of change in the tea industry in China were also from the, the British because the traders were paying money for certain types of tea and not paying money for other types of tea. So you have lots of activity and these activities seem independent. They're not. They're closely linked together. And unless people really draw you know, the line across so that you can see, sometimes it's very, very difficult to understand the push and pull effect of what goes on in the tea industry. So you are presumably entering the tea arena. Take your time. There's no rush on this. I have plenty to talk about, so 
I'll just keep talking until you're ready. So in addition to these areas that I'm talking about in Fujian province, in the early 1900s, other crafty Bungfu tea areas arose. So what's China producing? It's producing, okay. And let me put years beside this because otherwise you'll be confused. So from the 1680s all the way to the 1930s, what is China producing that's being mostly exported? It's red tea of various grades. So one grade is the mix between hand and simple machine. Another grade is pure Kung Fu grade where every step is done by hand. A third grade was the development of CT, CTC, crush, tear, and crumble. Maybe it's the other way around. Crumble, tear, and crush, who knows? At any rate, what it meant was producing tea that's been all crushed up, and most of that was being exported. Again, what was driving red tea? Historical factors, harder to counterfeit in Europe. So the tea industry didn't have leaks. Uh, you didn't have big smuggling issue in Europe. Secondly, tea was aligned with Buddhists and as Buddhists were traveling, they were taking this. And thirdly, tea was aligned with Islam. Why? Because the same way as Buddhists, okay? We have choices. We can drink alcohol, oh, or we can have this other beverage which doesn't allow us to make mistakes. Let's do this other beverage, reduce the mistakes. Yes. Wow, beautiful trichomes, ladies and tasters. Beautiful trichomes. Love that comment. So part and parcel of what Kung Fu tea is, particularly in Fujian, particularly in Fujian, full of trichomes. And again, that's because they have all these hand processes. Remember, I just described the gross processes. There's three or four more subtle processes that they use to form and make uniform and retain the trichomes. Good catch. Anything else on flavor or mouthfeel or energetics? So while you're thinking about this, again, I'll continue on a further forays. What are scientists today in China trying to do with red tea? We've talked about what happened to red tea as a whole in the uh, 1900s because China was falling apart. What was happening in the tea fields as they were being converted to green tea? And so all these, because the market for red tea was not available for the expense it cost the farmer. It was, the farmer was better off to go to green tea. So, so many of these areas turned to green tea. This very strong trend reversed in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when one of the leaders of the tea industry in China said, hey, What's wrong, what's wrong with you all? This is a historical monument in China that we are just tossing away. We've got to understand and recover these crafts. So the local governments were assigned to start putting money, assigned to start documenting. Scientists at the in institutes were assigned to start documenting and talking with the older farmers trying to understand the process. And this is why this started to recover. Yes. Uh, Jason says that they love the juicy mouthfeel to this tea. Juicy mouthfeel. Very good. Uh, another participant says she says maybe it was the name, but the first whiff of the warm leaves makes her feel like a celebration of the offering. Ah. This commentator talks about mental energetics, that the whiff 
and, and aroma and mental, the riff, uh, whiff reminded her of this is an opening round of a celebration. I actually love this comment a lot because tea can take you to a lot of different places. And this is a very legitimate place to go. Yes. Warming and calming energetics for Warming and calming energetics. Absolutely. I will tell you that I'm perspiring. And it's not because it's warm in the shop. It's actually not warm in the shop. But as I drink this, this is my internal feeling. This is the energetics for me. Yes. Another participant says, yes, it starts out smooth and juicy with a growing full mouth dryness. And then she says, I'm going to call it a dried fruit sweetness. Oh, good. I'm glad we're getting to this. So a growing astringency in the mouth. Yes, there is the juiciness. But this particular commentator makes a comment that they're getting a uh, fruit and a sweetness in this. And a dried fruit sweetness. I'm sorry, a dried fruit sweetness. And the dried fruit is key here because let's think about dried fruit. What sorts of flavors might be associated with many of the dried fruits? So while you're thinking about this, I'll continue. So there used to be craft, very craft red tea just outside of Hangzhou. And there was one or two farmers left in the 20s and 30s. This tea came back in our early tea explorations. And one year, it was probably 1992, I was talking to the vice mayor of Hangzhou. And he was telling me all the famous products of Hangzhou and you know, how Hangzhou is such a wonderful city. You got Westlake and on and on and on. And he didn't mention anything about this craft tea. And I said, oh, perhaps you grow craft red tea here? He said, no, no, that's other places. Now, all party officials who are in government, when they go to meetings like this, they always have at least one or two assistants. And so I see the assistant immediately start looking at his phone and trying to figure out what I might have been referring to. And then about three minutes later, he whispers into the vice mayor's ear. And the vice mayor says, very surprised, oh, it turns out we do have this craft tea here. And that was one of our very early explorations into craft black teas, because in the West, it's not very well understood that you have these small pockets. And some, in quotes, craft teas get famous because of wide publicity, not because of where they stand in the pantheon of craft teas. Yes. Uh, no feedback on the dried fruit implications, but some other great comments. A participant says it's a per first, it's a perfect rainy day tea with a smile. And another participant says moderate astringency, consistent on the tongue through swallowing and then a honey sweet smell. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, perfect for a rainy day, growing astringency. Uh, moderate, consistent on the tongue all the way through the swallow. Moderate, consistent on the tongue all the way through the swallow. And then a honey sweet smell. Ah, that's right. A honey sweet aroma. So, I love all of these. I'm going to help everybody return to the dried fruit for a moment because I think the dried fruit comment in some ways is key to understanding many of the Fujian craft teas. And what that is, is there's just a slight hint of tartness along with the sweetness there's that slight lingering hint, just like when you take a piece of dried fruit. It's not just sweet. There's usually a slight hint of tartness. Yes. 
Uh, Jismin says when she woke the leaves up, they smelled very sweet. The aroma of the tea is even sweeter. So the sweet, sweet smelly leaves after they were first warmed and then the tea liquor itself even sweeter. <laughs> so the tea leaves, and I immediately got this. When tea master shook the leaves up, I'm standing two or three feet away. I could smell that right away. Huge, attractive, sweet aroma. And this commentator said that when the tea liquor was produced, also a huge, even sweeter uh, aroma coming from that. Absolutely, on one. On, on Another participant comments that the dryness is gentle. Oh, I like this comment. Dryness is gentle. You're right. Compared to some of the other teas where it grabs a hold of your mouth and keeps you on your toes because it's driving the dryness, not this. This is, yes, the dryness is distinctly there, but all these other qualities, the juiciness, sweetness, the honey-like, the dried fruit, it's not preventing you from getting to this. Uh, another participant says it's just very smooth. Great comment. Very smooth. So in general, if you get a craft tea, if it isn't very smooth and mellow, generally speaking, a mistake has been made. And there's several types of mistakes, as we all know. One mistake could be a storage mistake. In China, that's rarer, but it's not inconceivable. Here, it's much more often. The second mistake could be an actual processing mistake. Remember, when you over-oxidize, you get towards sour, and that's a problem. And that affects the whole vibe of the tea. And it's really, really hard to recover from. It's not irrecoverable if you catch it right away. But if you let it get deep into the tea, irrecoverable. Participant says, hey, I'm ready for a second cup already. What's the timing? Brewing time for a second cup. For those who want to do a second cup, it's one minute. So it comes to flavor very fast. And again, you'll be reminded of that juiciness and just great flavor in the second cup. Another tasting comment. The multi scent of the warm leaves turned into a very subtle background of this tea. Multi scent of the warm leaves turned into subtle background. I like this comment as well because some teas, and particularly red teas, give you a consistency of profile from aroma to flavor all the way through the cup. This one does not. This has changing profile. And that's kind of what's interesting about this tea. One of the things that's interesting, and that's one of the things that attracted us, particularly as a contrast to some of the Yunnan reds. All right, so we're doing really, really well. Uh, and i tell you a few more things from a scientific viewpoint of what they're trying to work on with these craft teas. First off, in the regions where they do craft teas, they're trying to provide monetary incentives to go back to some of the traditional ways. Because truth be told, they now have a market in China who appreciates this type of tea and will pay the price it actually costs to, to make it. The other thing scientists are spending a lot of time doing, and you'll see more commentary, and this is driven by nutraceuticals. So what effect is the nutraceutical industry having on tea in China? Everybody is looking for that key, which can unlock either long life or something that is very effective against cancer or something that would knock COVID to its knees. In other words, they're looking for the magic pill in these leaves. And the scientists are now approaching this from a different perspective. So part of what they're saying 
is instead of just approaching from ideal aroma and ideal flavor perspective, let's think about what the ideal chemical constituent in game should be and how do we get there? And so these last two or three years, you've had scientists working with farmers, experimenting how long should we oxidize? How long should we live it? Let's take these at our increments and measure the differences in chemical constituents. Because really they're playing with the following things. They're trying to make sure that there's still catechins left in the red tea. Now, when you're using the CTC methodology and you were processing the heck out of the tea, you don't really care about those chemical constituents or you don't know to care, let's put it that way. You don't care so much about the flavor. All you're really trying to do is to get a product that looks and feels something like Lipton's, something that can go in a tea bag. And in some cases, you're doing it to countries that really don't care because they're putting spices in it, they're putting dried fruits in it, they're putting all sorts of things. So the actual quality of what they get, you don't really care. Yes. When is this tea harvested? This tea is a spring pick. And it's a spring pick that usually occurs in April, usually, usually around the start of April. So at any rate, when you don't have motivation to think about these gradations, because cost then becomes an issue because your end user says, well, oh, I only want to pay two pennies per pound or gram or whatever it is. Versus end users, particularly in China now, where they realize, hey, wait a minute. If we get this in the right combination, we're going to be able to influence flavor. We're going to be able to influence nutritive value. And it's huge because if you can retain a certain percentage of catechins in processed red tea, it's going to be a better nutrition value from the scientific perspective. So that's one of the things they're working on. By the way, how come catechins are going away? Catechins aren't going away. They polymerize or they combine into theoflavins, theorubigans, theobronins, and some other substances. And so if you are oxidizing for long periods of time, the catechins truly do go away. But what if you oxidize, say, only three hours? If you oxidize only three hours, you have some catechins left. You have theoflavins at a sufficient level that the briskness and the color of the tea look right. You have volatiles that the aroma tends to be sweet or tends to be something very pleasant. You've taken the L-theanine and still retained a portion of that so that you still have a little bit of umami flavor within the tea. So these are all issues that scientists, and again, driven from the nutraceutical, are really pursuing. Yes. What food pairing would you suggest with this particular red? Love this question. What food pairing with this particular red? This is fairly easy. This is an after meal, and part of what you're serving is some sort of a fresh fruit that's not watermelon or cantaloupe. You're serving usually a stone fruit with this, and cut up, and this would be a wonderful post-meal, calming, uh, easy for everybody to drink, if you're producing a baked good, so long as it wasn't excessively sweet, 
Uh, this would also, you know, just from the oven, I wouldn't serve brownies with this, but I would serve a shortbread of some sort. In fact, I definitely serve a short, buttery shortbread. That would go just perfect. Uh, participant says, Hey, I'm towards the end of my first cup and I'm feeling a nice, warm, cozy feeling. Yeah, great energetics comment. Uh, for whatever reason, I picked up this feeling faster. This commentator says at the end of the, the first cup, feeling cozy and warm. This tea will do that too. The craft teas in general seem to have, at least for me, a faster effect getting to that point of, wow, interjects with this or something else. Great for a cold, rainy day. Yes. What do you think of pairing with apple pie with some of the tea's tartness? Uh, yes. So a uh, pairing with apple pie, particularly uh, if you used uh, not real sweet apples, that would be a great pairing with this. Good. Uh, I haven't over talked yet. I'm about to over talk. The, I hope you take really, really good notes about these energetics, flavor profiles, mouthfeels, density, and all this stuff, because next week we're going to enter another red realm. And the week following that, we'll do that as well. Yes. What's the vintage of this particular tea? So the first time we had this in the shop, was right at the beginning. In, we actually bought in 2013. We replenished this in 2016. So this thing is six or seven years old and hence the mellowness. And, you know, this shows you something. You know, people are afraid sometimes of storing tea, but really this is proof to you that storing tea under the right conditions, particularly the reds, you can safely store 10 to 20 years. We set aside a small portion of the 213, which we don't serve to the public. Chave and I have that for ourselves. And part of it's an experiment for us. And it's still very, very flavorful. And we'll continue to work on this experiment because it's easy to tell you things last 10 to 20 years. We have people in the tea industry in China who have done the 10, 10 to 20 year thing. We're attempting to do that as well so that we have real life experience with this. All right, you've done a great job. This is a fun start to this session because it's in Fujian, it's craft. I look forward to seeing everybody next week and make sure you do the things you're supposed to do this week. Primarily, keep safe, keep healthy. You take care now. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.